Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's true. true. <laughs> right to left. Looks so the right to left. You got the Hebrew. Hebrew. Yeah, the Hebrew, Hebrew is, is from back to front. Right. Yeah. yeah, all the numbers are on this Greek side. Greek is the way we write, yeah. but Hebrew right. is backwards. Yeah, all the numbers the are on this side. side. <laughs> Let's uh, begin in prayer as well, and you guys can pass these around through. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for the morning that you've given us, a new morning, new mercies. Lord, we thank you that your, your love is everlasting, Lord, and it always flows to us, Lord, and, and never ceases, that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ if we're in him. Lord, we thank you for just the basic things of life this morning, food and, and uh, warm beds and even time to sleep, Lord. We ask that you would just continue to be gracious to us, Lord, as we look to your word and consider this subject of how your word was uh, transmitted, Lord. Give us wisdom, give us help, give us understanding, Lord, that we would have our faith even more confirmed and, and encouraged, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so, uh, yeah, continuing in bibliography this morning, the doctrine of Scripture, and I thought just uh, because a couple things came up last week, I wasn't really going to go in depth into this, but then as I thought about it more, I thought this is absolutely important to talk about. And so what we're going to talk about this morning is basically the manuscripts of the Old and New Testament and um, textual transmission and even textual variants. And there's so much I wrote this week that uh, it's going to take two weeks to go through it. So. I've broken it up. Um, some of the really interesting stuff is <laughs> going to be next week, but we'll uh, we'll also see some pretty pretty neat stuff this morning. So uh, this is maybe not going to be as engaging as a talk by James White or some scholar like that. But um, and and this is an area of study that is so deep, um, and it's so the people who work in this field are so specialized have so much expertise that I'm just, I'm talking as a lay person here really, so um, let's just kind of get into it. When we talk about the Old Testament, of course the original um, books of the Old Testament were written in Hebrew. You can see kind of a copy of the Hebrew there, that really thick volume that Ken has in his hands right now, and uh, it's written backwards if, if some of you have noted. The way we write. There's a, a long history of the transmission of the, the text of the Old Testament because uh, those original copies, of course, were written down by the prophets, but then they had to be kept up and copied over time. And we, one thing we have to know right away about uh, the Old Testament and New Testament is we don't have the original manuscripts, which they call the autographs. We don't have those anymore, right? Um, think of a book even from like 200 years ago. Um, it's going to be dusty. It's going to be, you know, pages are, <laughs> are fringed. And um, it's hard to find a book from even 100, 200 years ago that's in prime condition, right? So over time, all of the materials that people write with, they, they disintegrate, right? So, so we don't have the original autographs. But we do have the original text of the Old and New Testament because that has been preserved by scribes and people who repeatedly wrote these things down and so we have a reliable transmission of the original text. Okay, That's what we have to assert at the, at the forefront. So when we talk about the Old Testament in particular, it's a little bit different when we talk about Old and New Testament. We have a long history of what's called the Masoretic Text with us. Uh, so the Masoretes were trained Jewish scholars, scribes who um, wrote the manuscripts. Um, they uh, copied manuscripts and they preserved the text. And they were very highly trained. They were very, very careful. Uh, once they wrote a page of the, uh, the Old Testament, they would actually count every letter to make sure it had the exact number of letters that were 
supposed to be on that page. So they, they copied meticulously, and we still have Masoretic texts with us today. So the earliest we have is from 920 AD, the Aleppo Codex there. It was unfortunately partially burned in 1947. The building it was in was burned and, and it got damaged. And so they used to have a, a fuller text there, but uh, it was partially burned. Um, the, the oldest complete manuscript we have of the Old Testament by the Masoretes is from 1008 AD. Okay? And uh, these all are preservations of that Masoretic text, that Masoretic tradition, these scribes that repeatedly copied the Old Testament throughout history. And it's incredibly reliable, uh, and we do have even some of these ancient copies from about a thousand years ago, and more after that, right? So these point back to what we might call a proto-Masoretic text, they call it, just preserving that Masoretic tradition. What we also have from an earlier date is the Dead Sea Scrolls. This was a huge discovery in 1946 to 56. They kept discovering in these caves uh, near the Dead Sea. There were several caves, seven to be exact, um, where there were ancient manuscripts preserved um, from the 3rd century BC to the 1st century AD. So these are extremely old uh, documents, and they contain the oldest copies we have of many Old Testament books. Okay, so that was a very important uh, discovery, and comparing those with the, the uh, Masoretic texts, we've seen just how reliable that transmission is. We also have what's called the Septuagint, or abbreviated as the LXX. Uh, this is the Greek translation of the Old Testament from the third century BC. So we had many copies of that from early time. This was the Bible even the apostles were often familiar with. Uh, they quote from the Septuagint in the New Testament often. So if you read the book of Hebrews, for instance, we went through that uh, a couple years ago here. And uh, we noted a lot of times where they would quote, and it was this translation in the Greek of the, uh, of the Old Testament. Some of these translations were more literal, word for word. Some were a bit more free. Like if you think of English translations today where, you know, the NASB or NKJV, these are very literal word for word translations. Um, you get further over to like the NLT that's a bit of a freer trying to put into uh, modern common idioms and English just to make it clearer, thought for thought, not necessarily word for word. So there were some differences in the way that some of the books were translated in terms of their philosophy, li literal or more free, but it was, a, a, again, a faithful um, translation of the original text. So, so all of these taken together, what we have in the Masoretic tradition, Dead Sea Scrolls, and the Septuagint, plus others, there are, there are various other manuscripts that we have from early dates, um, in different languages even. There's some, some in like Syriac, for instance. Um, yeah, this is not my field of expertise, but I've been listening to stuff on this. Um, there's something called the Samaritan Pentateuch, which was copied by the Samaritans, you know, how uh, after Samaria was conquered by Assyria, some of them came back and mingled with the Gentiles, and then they created their own religion. John 4, Jesus talks to the Samaritan woman, and they had differences of belief. But they copied the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, the Samaritan Pentateuch, they call it. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting one. They actually, they make some changes to the wording in the Torah because of their religious beliefs and their biases. But it's an interesting one to kind of compare and, and help reconstruct the original text. So that's a word on the manuscripts of the Old Testament. If you have questions on this, I don't know if I can answer them, <laughs> if there are any questions at this point.
a slide on the New Testament now. So, the case of the New Testament, it's a little bit of a different case. Um, we have many, 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 many manuscripts. We have over 5,000 manuscripts. The most recent count is um, something like 5,800 manuscripts, ranging from about 113 AD through the centuries. And this is unheard of for, for any ancient document. Um, I had a slide last time, actually, where I can run back to that quickly. Yeah. This is a list of some ancient documents and the number of copies that we have of them from an ancient time, and yet um, a lot of these, the earliest copy we have of them is, you know, like a thousand years difference from when they were written. Uh, so, for instance, Plato's writings, we have seven ancient copies, earliest from 900 AD, but it was supposed to have been written in 400 BC. So there's a really big gap um, and very few copies. But when you look at the New Testament, the story is, is completely different because we have 5,800 manuscripts and uh, the earliest one is from about 113 AD, they estimate. There are four main types of manuscripts. Um, Papyri are the earliest. These are put on papyrus, which was uh, a paper they made out of papyrus reeds. And they would stamp them together and, and so on and so forth, and, and then they'd write on them. So that's the earliest kind of form of writing we have. So you'll see that the earliest manuscripts we have are on papyri. And then there are unseals, which are documents that are written in capital letters on parchment. And the papyri are also in capital letters. Um, it's kind of interesting. So you look at the uh, Greek New Testament I passed out there. I'm not sure where it is right now. Right the here. blue cover. You'll notice it has uh, capitals and lowercase letters. Mm -hmm. That's how we study and read Greek today. But the earliest manuscripts only had capitals. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have punctuation. And so uh, words would just kind of run together in these uh, capital letters. And it um, makes it harder to read because most people who learn Greek today, well, pretty much everyone learns Greek today, <laughs> like the Greek I learned in seminary, we don't just focus on the capital letters. In fact, we don't focus on them much at all. And so I'm fuzzy on which capitals are which, actually. Um, but we, we, we read mostly in the what's called the minuscules, or the lowercase letters. Mm -hmm. But those early manuscripts were different. And uh, so there's papyrus was the earliest writing instrument. Then you had um, mostly parchment being used for a long time. That was uh, like deer or, you know, different cattle, different skins of animals they would stretch out and make into a kind of paper. And then, uh, again, they were writing for, with unseals, capital letters, for many years. The later manuscripts we have, they started using minuscules. They started using lowercase letters in addition to the capitals. And put in punctuation and spaces and all of that to make it easier to read. A fourth category of what we have is lectionaries, which were worship books that contain scripture readings. Think of, uh, you know, I on a Sunday decided to print out the scripture readings that were going on that Sunday morning. So we have those from very early that, you know, church fathers and, and elders would have used to, uh, to, to, to speak in their churches. And so those preserved the text as well. Um, many of the earliest ones we have are fragments, okay, so the earliest manuscripts we have are, are usually fragments. Papyrus, again, doesn't last super well over time, um, but it is remarkable. We have so many of them even today. Um, so you'll often see, you know, there's fragments. You can't read the whole text or the whole page, but edges will be kind of cut off and so on. And they're damaged in various ways. Uh, and so those are the earliest texts we have. Then you start to get, you know, complete books. 
and even then complete New Testaments, complete Old Testament and New Testament, what they call codices or codexes, um, these large books that contain the Old Testament and New Testament or the full New Testament. And uh, so they, act they actually started, you know, putting, putting leaflets together, right, and binding them into books. So we have a lot of fragments, books, and collections from before the 4th century. The earliest fragment, supposedly, that, that we have, according to their, you know, it's an estimate on what, how they're dating, but they can, they can tell with quite a degree of accuracy within 25, 50 years when a, when a manuscript is from. So the earliest is P52, it's called, and it's from about 113 AD. It contains some verses from John chapter 18, I believe it is. Um, so that's the earliest. The oldest complete Old Testament and New Testament codices are from the 300s and 400s. Codex Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, Alexandrinus, and Ephraim. So the, these are the oldest codices we have. And uh, particularly two of them, I believe it would be Vatic Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, are from the 300s, so they're the earliest. And so often um, scholars refer to those because they're considered the earliest and best manuscripts that we have of the complete Old Testament and New Testament. Um, but we also, like the Old Testament, we have other language translations like Latin, Syriac, so very old Latin manuscripts, Syriac manuscripts. We have quotes from church fathers, which a number of scholars have noted. You could gather the whole New Testament, minus maybe a few verses, just from the writings of the church fathers. So that also gives us great confidence that even if we didn't have all these manuscripts, we'd have the, the writings of the church fathers and we can reconstruct the text. Any questions at, at that point? Um, that's just an overview of the kind of manuscripts that we have. Over here. It would be, I didn't put any pictures in here, but it would be cool to show you guys some pictures maybe as well. So, just talking a bit about the study of the manuscripts here. Um, as I said, there are experts in this field. There's a whole field of study dealing with these manuscripts. Scholars preserve these texts and study the wealth of manuscripts that we have access to to determine the original readings. Um, one guy you might want to drop down his name if you're taking notes is uh, Daniel B. Wallace. And he has um, what's called the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts. They have a website, and you can actually go on his website. He's done work over the last number of decades just traveling the world and doing high-resolution photography on as many manuscripts as he possibly can. He's got a long list still to go, but there's like thousands and thousands of manuscripts that he's so far cataloged, and uh, you can actually see pictures of these early, early manuscripts. Really cool. Um, so that's part of the work of just preserving those manuscripts, that, that people in the future would be able to look at them and, and reference them. Um, and what has to be said as well, there are many conservative scholars within this field who believe strongly in the inspiration, inerrancy, reliability, and preservation of the text of Scripture. So, um, yeah, there are some liberal scholars in this field, for whatever reason, not sure why they're so, so on about studying the Bible, but uh, <laughs> that don't believe in the inspiration or inerrancy of Scripture, but... Um, there are many conservative scholars in this field, like I mentioned, Danny Wallace, um, Dr. James White, it's a good reference to look at, things like this, um, Dr. Peter Gentry, 
I actually got to study with him at TBS. He was my Old Testament professor and realized later, man, this, this guy is, I knew he was a genius then, but I mean, he's actually an authority on Old Testament uh, canon and, and manuscripts, and he specializes in the Septuagint. Um, so if you can handle uh, <laughs> a, le a lecture from him, um, go look him up. Can be a little dry, but uh, he's a great guy. Um, so, one thing we have to talk about when we do talk about the, the text is textual variance. Um, James White gives an illustration. If on a s Sunday, um, it's a modified version of the illustration, but if on a Sunday I, I copied down a, a paragraph of my own writing and I, I gave a copy to someone in the front row, and they copied it, say, three times. And then, and my messy handwriting, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and then they pass those copies back to the second row and ask people to keep copying it and handing their copies back. To the back row, do you think that there would be some changes by the back row? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Given the fact that human beings, we, we do make errors, <laughs> right? And the fact that even my writing wasn't perfect in the beginning, um, someone might be, what is that word? Oh, okay. And, and suppose you couldn't talk to the person in front of you, right? Or you couldn't run up to the front and ask me what I wrote. There would be differences by the time you get to the back. Now, what if some of those were damaged? What if we threw out half of them? What, what do we have then, right? Um, now, that's not exactly comparable to the case with the New Testament and Old Testament because we know we have just just a crazy amount of manuscripts, okay? So we do have a wealth of resources, but that gives you a little bit of picture of how textual variants come into that tradition, right? Through various scribal er errors over time, we do see variants come into the text. Um, but as we talk about this and just introduce this subject, a couple of things we should mention is that with the, uh, I guess speaking, yeah, both of Old, Old Testament and New Testament, but especially with the New Testament, we have what's called free transmission. The transmission of the text was not highly controlled, but it was rather free gain which is actually a very good thing for us. Um, if, say, there was one church, you know, in, in the early church, and it was very cult-like, and you had to belong to this church, and, and they had all of the manuscripts of the New Testament, and they were tightly controlled and, and only copied by their scribes, could we trust that as much as a free transmission of the text, where Actually, anybody could copy these things at any time, even lay people and trained scribes and, and all of this. And, and we have a wealth of manuscripts from a widespread area that was not tightly controlled. Because if someone controls the transmission of the text, well, they can decide, okay, actually, we, we want to change this here. We, we want to, uh, we have this theological bias, and so we'll, we'll change this and that and the other. And... Uh, that's kind of what we see with something like the Quran, right? The Quran was actually tightly controlled, and earlier versions were destroyed, and it was preserved in the way they wanted it to be. Whereas with the New Testament, we have this very open and free transmission. This actually bolsters confidence that we can trace back to the original. Um, there was no agenda going on with the, the whole transmission of the New Testament. We also have something called tenacity. That is this, this concept that when something gets in the text, it stays in the text. Because scribes are trying to be very, very careful about writing what they've received, right? And so even if they've received, say, a scribal error, they will preserve that error. And that means we can actually trace back in a textual family and see where it comes from to a common origin point, okay? So that actually helps the science of uh, textual criticism, is what you might call it. 
sometimes I feel like that's a bad term because um, sometimes it, it was criticism kind of gives this idea that it's maybe higher criticism or something, but that's not the case. <laughs> higher criticism is kind of a uh, liberal kind of school of theology, but um, textual criticism is what we call it. But there, there's a science to this, right? Tenacity helps us to understand the, uh, the textual traditions. I hope this is making some sense. <laughs> I'm kind of passing on information from uh, people much smarter than I am. So, so well, I'll just take yeah. the, the Lord's Prayer, for example. It's longer mm -hmm. in the King James than it is in any of the newer ones. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that some of that stuff was added at some point? And they put the it in the King James, the and then they had, better, they had better yeah. manuscripts later and left that out? I assume so. I haven't looked into that particular instance, but maybe I'll do that next week as well. Yeah, that is a good, good example. Um, uh, more modern translations leave it out, right? They do. But they footnote it, um, so that likely means that with the wealth of manuscripts we have now, compared to earlier translations that we found that that's not an original reading. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what textual criticism actually is, yes. is that mm -hmm. the more manuscripts they are and the closer they get to the original, the more chance you have of it being actually what was truly written. And yep. like they, do, they take this seriously and that's yeah. good because that's, that we begin to trust mm -hmm. what was actually written. Mm -hmm. and if, if, say, an, uh, an early manuscript, and most of them said this, and then all of a sudden it changes in one spot, the rest of them don't change, but this one does, you can, you can look at where the problem actually came from. And, exactly. Yeah, and it, it is a very exact science, way more exact than people give it credit for. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how do we convey that to an unbeliever? Like, what I've been witnessing to people sometimes is say, can't read Greek, or we can't read the earlier manuscripts, so you can't trust the English. Well, there are many people who can. Yeah, I say you can. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and go learn it. <laughs> if you're so concerned, go learn Greek. Or even like a Muslim <laughs> friend of mine who said, well, you, your, your Gospels would change to ask, well, how, which part, but he couldn't, he didn't know. Right. There, there's logical tests, too. Like. Does it have internal coherence? Mm -hmm. Is it consistent? Mm -hmm. uh, like, does it have external coherence? Yep. Does it, uh, is there continuity mm -hmm. from one book to the next, to the next, to the next? Mm -hmm. There is. Yeah, so we'll talk about different variants and different uh, criteria for understanding these things. Um, so just keep in mind those two con concepts there, free transmission, tenacity. Um, so kinds of scribal errors that these are well categorized um, by textual scholars that, that there are different categories of scribal error that can happen. And sometimes it's quite obvious why the error happened. Um, there are errors of sight where if you think about uh, being a scribe in the ancient time and you didn't have fluorescent lights and you're working by candlelight or something, or maybe wow. your own eyes are not great and you don't have glasses. <laughs> there could be many errors of sight. Or, or you look up and then you look down and you write something and, and you know, there's a lot of error that can happen just just in that, uh, that kind of uh, scenario, right? There's sometimes errors of hearing where sometimes they would actually have um, a number of scribes in a scriptorium and someone would be reading the manuscript from the front as scribes copied it by hearing. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you might hear a word, and you know, if you listen to a song or something, sometimes you don't always know what the singer is saying, and you might sing some different lyrics. <laughs> if you, there's whole websites on misheard song lyrics. Yeah. When you go read it, you're like, that's what that says? You know? <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. at one time, time music albums, you could fold out the, the CD liner or the tape liner, and it had all the lyrics for the right. song there. Yeah. Probably won't sound that good. <laughs> so, I mean, you, you sing it, you're like, that doesn't sound like <laughs> Yeah. That doesn't make much sense. Yeah, Even so the tune, though, I mean, if somebody learns it slightly off, 
then you're not singing the tune. And you make up your own words lyrics. for it. <laughs> yeah, you add a beat to it, so you have to add words. <laughs> yeah. So you can see how errors of hearing can happen. Uh, there's also something called haplography, where you miss a chunk because of a similar or same word. So, say I'm writing a paragraph, and up here it says uh, Daniel B. Wallace, and then a num number of other words, and then down here it also says Wallace in the same place, and I, I, I'm a scribe and I'm recording this and I'm looking up and I, I, I write Wallace and then I look down and then I look up again and I accidentally go to this Wallace, well I've just missed a chunk of the text. Mm -hmm. So that happens, it's called haplography. Then there's something called dittography, where you might repeat a sentence. We've probably all done these things, mm -hmm. typing, right, or, yeah. <laughs> or writing, mm -hmm. for the older <laughs> generation. Mm -hmm. Or transposition, the switching order of words, etc. Just this past couple of weeks, there was an example of this in my household, where Janelle has a whiteboard in the kitchen, and she writes uh, memory verses on it. And this memory verse said, uh, Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. It's Psalm 34 or 3 or something like that. And uh, the first time she wrote it, and then some friends came over for dinner, and they're like, that's not quite right. Because it said, keep your tongue evil and your <laughs> lips from speaking deceit. <laughs> so, uh, she missed a word. <laughs> and a very important word. Uh, and then she wrote it again, trying to correct it, and it said, keep your from tongue evil, and your lips from speaking the same. <laughs> so she couldn't, couldn't get it. She writes with me. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an illustration of, uh, of scribal error. Um, there is a story uh, James White was telling about um, a scribe who was writing the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, and at this was sometime in the Catholic Church, and they were very, very severe about their scribes, and uh, they could be punished if they made errors. And this fellow, um, he got to the sixth commandment, which is... Adultery. <laughs> Thou shalt commit adultery. The sixth commandment is you shall not murder. Yeah. Okay. Um, and he left out a very important word. Not. not. <laughs> <laughs> you shall murder. And apparently that guy went to the dungeon. Oh, man. That scribe got punished. <laughs> so, uh, it's a known fact that scribes who also did not drink their coffee on a given morning were more prone to error. <laughs> and, uh, cheesy joke. Being able, to, <laughs> being able to write at one time was not common either. Like That's educated right. person yep. was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most people were illiterate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they would, you know. So, on the variants, also textual scholars use various criteria to determine which reading is likely to be original. There's more to this, and there's, you know, these things are even continually being refined as a science, but um, generally, um, I guess this is not so much case anymore, I've read, but uh, the early days of textual criticism, they, they would say that shorter readings were to be generally preferred, because things tended to be added, right? So people kind of contest that or agree. In certain instances, it, it doesn't hold, but these are general rules. Shorter readings are generally preferred. Older readings are generally preferred, obviously, because they're closer to the original text in time. Uh, more widely attested readings are generally preferred. That makes sense, obviously. What does it mean by rougher readings? Rougher readings are generally preferred. So, um, yeah. So there, there might be a tendency in later scribes to kind of smooth things out. Or, you know, this sounds rough. Or maybe this grammar here is really rough here. Oh, and, and they might kind so of smooth the grammar things out. isn't perfect. Yeah, it could be things oh, like that. Oh, okay, so... That will arise from, from translating from one language to another. It won't be... Yeah, you have, you have to invent words that don't exist in other languages. Yeah, so 
sometimes we Yeah, I mean, here we're just talking about the <laughs> copying of the original language, right? So um, translation is another issue, but um, this is where, yeah, you might come across really rough grammar. Oh, Peter's grammar is really bad here. <laughs> Let's just smooth that out a little bit. <laughs> um, That's dangerous because... Yeah. It, he even says in First Peter that it was actually Silas who who wrote First Peter for him. Yep. Right. And so the grammar, of course, would be better because Silas was more well educated. Mm -hmm. In Second Peter, it's much rougher. Yep. And a lot of people say, well, it couldn't be written by the same guy. But yes, it was written by the same guy, yeah. except if he didn't have Silas to actually yeah, yeah. write for him. He had to write himself. Mm -hmm. So it would be rougher. Mm -hmm. You know, it actually. It actually proves more that you know if they're not trying to to cover it up. If you try to do that, yeah. you're actually ruining the, what it actually originally yeah. is. Yeah. But again, you could see um, again by tracing these things back and seeing, okay, maybe this scribe was thinking he's going to clean up a little bit of the grammar here. We can tell by the fact that there's a rougher reading that we also have and a smoother reading. So. That's why rougher readings are preferred, um, generally. Um, then there's also internal evidence, like, okay, something doesn't fit the style of the writing that comes before it, or the, um, or the, the words that this author uses, or even the theology, okay? You, you can see some manuscripts would have a, a Gnostic influence, some heretical group gets a hold of manuscripts. They start to add things and change things that fit their theology. Um, but we can see those things and we can understand, okay, that, that's, not, that's not genuine, that's not original. Okay? Like the message. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's an abomination. <laughs> I don't like the message at all. Oh yeah. That's another one. Yeah. Same category. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, don't go reading the message. What did the Jehovah's oh, Witnesses have? New Living Trans Translation. The New World Translation. New World Translation. Where it's instead of the way, the truth, and the life, it's a way. And they remove uh, And Jesus was Albert. Jesus was uh, Albert, not a God, yeah. Avoid that translation. Yeah. yeah. NWT, <laughs> Message, Passion, Good News Bible, I've heard some negative things about mm -hmm. that. The pictures in it? Yeah. <laughs> Still around? Yeah, it's got like stick oh. figures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not necessarily the most reliable message. Um, but they make a lot of money doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if it's different enough, then they can oh, it's like 150 yeah. different Bible translations. There is a marketing component to it. For yes. Sure, yeah. um, so we have all kinds of variants in the New Testament text, especially. Um, the interesting thing about the Old Testament is it was generally a little more carefully copied by trained professional scribes. Okay, but it wasn't tightly controlled. It was just you know the men took it especially seriously. Like I said, you know, counting even the letters and and so on. They had a very exact science about it in the New Testament. I mean, you had a persecuted church that was on the run half the time. You know, a lot of uneducated people even, but, you know, a more, yeah, so it was maybe less, um, less carefully copied by trained professionals. But, uh, with the New Testament variants, this stuff is really important here, okay? Hear this. Okay, so we've talked about a lot of variants here. Um, maybe that's starting to make you go, oh man, there are so many variants. Like, can we trust the text? But here's the thing about the variants. 99 point something percent of them are not meaningful changes or not viable or both. And uh, what do we mean by meaningful? Well, that they actually change the meaning of a word or phrase. Viable would mean that they they could be the original, but in the vast like 99 some percent of cases, we can tell this is absolutely not original. This is not viable, or this is not meaningful, or both. Mm -hmm. Both.
both of those. So that's, that's the biggest category of variance that we have, that they're not meaningful and they're not viable, or both. So many of these would be differences of spelling. Okay, if you spell a word differently in Greek, but it still means the same thing, what does it matter? <laughs> uh, Daniel Wallace gave an illustration of this. Um, I'll talk about this in a second. Another example would be word order. And word order doesn't matter in Greek like it does in English. We have, we, we try to have at least, those who are refined in their speech, you know, <laughs> a subject, a verb, an object. There's a sentence structure that we're to follow in English. Greek is not like that. You can put the verb in the front, subject way at the back, that makes it hard to translate. <laughs> you have to kind of look for, okay, what is this word? What's the subject here? Where's the verb? Where's the... Um, but so word order could get changed, potentially, and it, some of the variants are <coughs> just that. The word order is changed. But it still doesn't affect the meaning. Or maybe it's a removal of a word that is inconsequential. Sometimes there will be places like where Lord was inserted in front of Jesus. Or um, it's it was, it was originally Jesus Christ, but then they make Christ Jesus. <laughs> so tons of those changes are just little inconsequential things like that, right? Um, so that's what we have to understand. The vast majority of the changes are, are totally inconsequential. And we can still get back to the original uh, reading. Um, yeah, Daniel Wallace gave an illustration. He takes a phrase in Greek, uh, John loves Mary. And he found, just sitting down <laughs> as a Greek scholar himself, he, he tried to find the number of ways that he could write that in Greek. And he found 350 or something ways that he could write the phrase, John loves Mary. Really? <laughs> yeah. And then it's true. It's only three words. <laughs> I, I know. It's, it's weird, but with all the changes in word order, with the fact that uh, with names in Greek, you can have it without the definite article or with the definite article. Mm -hmm. and so you could have John with the definite article and Mary without it, or both of them with it, or with the variants just multiply and multiply, right? Mm -hmm. So that's an illustration of how even with like word order changes, little things like that, that don't affect the meaning, there could be so many variants. Um, one thing also we should note here, I don't know if I put this in here, um, the problem is not that we're missing parts of the New Testament. That's not the problem with textual variants. It's that we have much more <laughs> than the New Testament. And we can understand sift through all of that data to get to the original. We're not missing the original, ever. We just have more material that we have to sift through, okay? So the original has been preserved, okay? So, so that, that should bolster your confidence right there as we talk about textual variants. Okay, let's, let's look at a, an example, okay? of something that is um, viable and meaningful, okay? So open up your Bibles. Do some of you have different translations? Got yeah, some ESPs here. King James. King James. You have the NASB. Yeah. You have the NASB you can. I, I didn't bring it with me, so I had to have an ESV. That's right. <laughs> so let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 12. Yeah, we can have access to pretty much anything on our phones. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. We can look at some other translations there. We can even look at the bad ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians 1. So Second Corinthians 1. And I'm going to read verse 12 from the ESV. It says... For our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, 
not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God, and supremely so toward you. Hmm. Notice, with simplicity and godly sincerity, that's what the ESV says. That word simplicity has a footnote after it in the ESV. And if you look down at the, the three there, it says some manuscripts have holiness. Mm -hmm. Mine does. Yep. NAB yes, the take. LSB does. The NASB has holiness as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. What does the King James have there? Uh, uh, Second Corinthians 12? No, 1. 1. 12. 1. 12. The NIV has integrity. Integrity and godly sincerity or something yeah. like that? Yeah. Interesting. If someone has the KJV, um, to read. For our rejoicing of this, the testimony of your conscience, that in simplicity and God with certainty, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the word more abundantly to you. So um, the KJV has simplicity, like the ESV has simplicity. The legacy has holiness. And ESV would have holiness. Any other translations we have? Or? The Berean has holiness. Sorry? The Berean has holiness. Berean? Yep. I haven't heard of that translation. Uh, or the Berean study Bible. Okay. The CSB has pure, uh, purity. Purity. Godly sincerity and purity. Okay. It's maybe an in between, but uh, <laughs> so simplicity and holiness mean two different things. Okay. Uh, you know, related ideas, I guess, but uh, they mean different things. And there, the thing there is, there is a textual variant there. Okay. So um, simplicity would be haplotati in Greek, and holiness is hagiotati in Greek. You notice those words are similar, right? They sound similar, haplotati, hagiotati, they look similar. Uh, the endings are the same, the beginning is the same. And uh, so there's a difference there. In Greek, these look even more similar. This is what it would have looked like in the original Greek. Either it was this one on the left here, which is haplotati, or it was the one on the right, which is hagiotati. Even from a far distance, you probably can't see, but maybe a little blurred, it looks exactly the same, right? Pretty close. Now, do you see how a scribe could have made an error here? Oh, yeah. Sure. So which is the right one? It's a good question. <laughs> um, so they look almost the same. Which is why the scribe could, could make a, a mistake here. Maybe he was more familiar with the word haplotati, and it occurs more in Paul. And he, he says, he's just looking up and he just thinks he sees haplotati, and he writes that down. Um, one of these words is the original. So we have the original text preserved, okay? Because we know there's two options. Which one is the correct one? That is a judgment that needs to be made based on all kinds of factors. Okay? So this is an interesting resource here. It's called the Textual Commentary on the Greek New Testament. This guy, Bruce Metzger, he, he, he uh, lists all the variants that are known in the New Testament. And he gives a judgment on what he thinks is the original reading. So, it, yeah, it's a lot of work. Uh, this guy was a genius, <laughs> and he, he is really a treasure to the church. Um, but uh, in 2 Corinthians here, one twelve, you can go to that verse. And he says, he thinks, haplotati, since simplicity, is the right reading. And he's fairly confident about that. They have kind of a rating system on how confident they are. And this is not just Bruce Metzger, but a, a committee of people. And he says this. Okay, I'll just read this to you. It is difficult to decide between hagiotati and haplotati, either of which could be easily confused with the other. He lists the Greek, what it looked like. Although the reading hagiotati has strong and early support, and he lists manuscripts that have it, 
A majority of the committee favored the Western and Byzantine reading haplotate. He lists other manuscripts. Because A, the context seems to require a word meaning simplicity rather than holiness. B, the word haplotes occurs a number of times in second Corinthians. And C, the word hagiotes is never used elsewhere by Paul. The readings praotete and splanknois are secondary variations that presuppose haplotete. So he says there's, there's even other variant readings that are lesser known that presuppose haplotete. Now, he's mentioned there, Hagiotete has some strong and early support in some early manuscripts. But, based on a number of other factors and, and this other family that, that favors the other, um, the other word, and because of context and Pauline usage, and some other factors from other variants, their judgment would be they're fairly confident that the original reading was haplotate. Now, I've, I've looked at this one a few times, and I'm like, again, I'm, I'm looking at this as more of a layperson. <laughs> I don't know that all the ins and outs of textual criticism. I have to kind of sift through and look, okay, what manuscripts are they talking about? I have to do extra work to even understand their notations. Probably best for me to say, okay, that sounds reasonable. It's probably haplotating. <laughs> but uh, at the end of the day, there are judgments to be made here, okay? Um, so, that's kind of where we're at with some of these things. We do have the original reading, okay? It is preserved, but there's still a bit of judgment that needs to be made sometimes. Does that make sense? But I, I do hope that that all encourages you regarding the Word of God and how we do have it so preserved. God has gifted us with teachers like Metzger and uh, you know other textual scholars and also pastors sometimes to help us through these things. Uh, so hope that is it. We should end there. Yes. And we'll look at some bigger, more interesting variants next week. Okay. Ken, you want to close the shirt? Lord, we. Uh... We trust your word. You are ultimately in charge of what you say. And we have to trust in that. You put it in the hearts of people that, um, that take this seriously, that take your word seriously. And all scripture is that We really do see that. We thank you for it. Thank you for this teaching. And this, again, for it. Ultimately, it's not about how much we know in our hands, yeah, really in our hearts. It's just to go to our heart and change our lives. So we become it's more like you. We can be growing in the age of Christ. And we thank you for it and for that.